Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we share all things people stuff in leadership. Learn from leaders who have done the hard yards and learn from experience. Hear from expert authors about the latest insights from culture to strategy and messy people dynamics. Get tips and insights from multiple award-winning author and leadership expert herself, Zoe Routh. Now, on with the show. I love interviewing leaders who really put their mouth where their money is. And today's guest is a perfect example of that. He is a business leader from the UK. His name is Paul Hargreaves. He's got a number of different feathers to hit in his cap. I suppose like strings to his bow, feathers in his cap. <laughs> One of them is that he's a, a B Corps ambassador. So his company, which is Cotswold Fair, became a B Corps company in 2014. And it has transformed the way that they operate and do business. And Paul walks us through some really interesting aspects of his leadership journey and the insights he's had along the way. So he's a B Corps ambassador. He's CEO of the Cotswold Fair, which supplies retail outlets across the UK and Ireland with artisan food. He is also an author. He's written two books, and his latest one is called The Fourth Bottom Line. It's a beautiful little book, easy to read. It's got 52 principles that you can adopt as a leader to help you be more human more compassionate, and therefore way more effective in what it takes to running a, a business that makes a difference in the world. So our conversation ranges across many different topics, largely around purpose and meaning and how we do that better and well. Okay, let's go. Paul Hargreaves, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Good to be here. I know Paul's trying to talk all low because his family is still sleeping. It's early hours over in the UK. So I appreciate you making the time zone thing work. It is a challenge in this global situation. But the benefit is we get your wisdom that we can get on tap. Now, you've had such an amazing career. You've got your second book out now, which is a beautiful handbook. I see it as cultivating the best leadership attributes to be a compassionate and hopefully wise leader. But we don't all start out that way in leadership. Like we don't just sort of emerge onto the scene as, as I was saying before we started the recording, as a sophisticated, savvy leader. We we start off somewhere else. So how did where did you start off as a leader, and how did you end up where you are now? Well, I think to me, there's three different types of leaders. There's my very young type of leader, which would be probably that on the the football field or sports field quite ego-led. Uh, being a leader was very important, and as it is to still some presidents and prime ministers, I, I would say. It's all too important, and it's all about position and, and status and stuff like that. I think later on, and this is the place most people are, are in in their leadership, and I was in for many, many, many years, is much more like a, a doing leader. So it's all about activity. Everything, your your whole value is tied up in productivity and how much you can get done and cramming in early morning meetings like this every single day of the week. And then the state I've become into, and really what the, the fourth bottom line is about, is, is about being a being leader. And there are very few of them around. Uh, they are leaders who are reflecting they're probably doing less but achieving more because they've learned to take a step back they have time on their own, they reflect before making decisions, they collaborate, they involve a lot more people in their, in their leadership. And that's, uh, I wouldn't say I'm there yet, but that's the, the place I am reaching and working on these days. That's fabulous. What you just described was a fabulous example of different integral leadership development model steps. I'm not sure if you're familiar with any of the work of integral leadership models, are you? No. no oh my God. Really. <laughs> That's fabulous. Well, you know, the ego piece, which is all about, you know, I'm the shining star, I know what I'm doing, and look at me, is the expert stage of leadership development. And then, you know, pulling it all together and harnessing a team and productivity and results is the achiever stage of leadership development. And then this part where you're talking about now, which is all about being a leader, where you accomplish more through the outputs and development of others by being reflective and getting the space and doing that kind of thing is a shift in an integral to 
different stages. They all have different names. Uh, individualist in one of the particular model frameworks. I call it the amplifier stage, where people are really thinking about how can I do things in a more, deal with the complexity in a little bit different way and elevate others around me. And it's a bit more of a, a circle of impact that we're concerned about. Yeah, and would never have we needed that kind of leadership more because the days of experts are, are long gone. People don't want experts, do they? The Gen why Gen Z coming into the workplace now they don't want experts they want collaboration probably more than than ever before people aren't happy to sit in a company and be told what to do anymore I, I don't know if they ever were actually but that, that was a, a norm that you had to fit into and I think now is the time for more being leaders to emerge and we desperately need them if we're gonna use business to to make this world better than it is currently Absolutely. So yes, yes, and yes to all of what you just said. Was there a particular time where you could mark the shift from being about productivity and meeting after meeting to, hang on a minute, there's got to be more to this than just meeting targets. I want to make a difference in the world. Was it a slow awakening or was it an incident or an epiphany that occurred for you? That's a, yeah, um, probably, yes. And, and, and probably the answer to the question is two or three occasions. So one for me was um, was being in hospital with malaria, uh, and I think an encounter. Not that I was ever going to pass away or anything, but you know, realizing your own mortality in that way. And I was not very well for quite a number of weeks. Uh, I think that helps break down all the extraneous stuff and makes you reassess what you're doing with your life. And shortly before that, we had um, a major breakdown in the business, put in a new warehouse management system. It all went horribly pear-shaped. I thought for probably six weeks, there was a good chance we might lose the whole business. There was an opportunity for the uh, the ego certainly to, <laughs> to melt away. Sure. <laughs> um, I think I realized during both those times that too much of my value it was was in what I was doing rather than who I was and both in very very different ways and that was yeah as I said it was within a space of eight months actually both those two events um, so I think they they helped me get away from the the doing and learn to start being I think other things as well but I think they were the two key events that that helped that transition for me and it would be different for every person of course you know the everyone comes to these things in a different way another thing later on was was spending some time in india on a on a spiritual walk and learning and some of what i just said at the beginning was was taken from hindu spirituality which i think's got a lot to a lot to offer us uh, activist leaders in the west how did you end up Tell me a little bit. I'm now, now I, I love India. I've been there several times. I have strong connection there. Wh- how did you end up doing a spiritual journey in India? What was that about? Um, well, we were doing, um, my whole leadership team were doing a, a Stepping into Authentic Leadership course, which is, that course is based on one of the guys who runs that is, is an Indian. He would call himself a modern mystic. And we were just tapping into that. And a a friend of mine who had also done that and was running courses, he's he's one of our customers, bizarrely, a a supermarket owner in London. He said to me one day, he said, Paul, I've got this, uh, I'm going on this spiritual walk in in India. Uh, I don't really want to go on my own. There's, you know, there's 12 other people going, but I'd like someone I know to go with me. Would you mind coming? I said, well, (laughs) Andrew, I've never considered such a thing but I do like India so um, yes I'll pack my bags and then I heard nothing about this thing said yes Sujit who was the guy that was running it and uh, said basically said yes my wife and one of my uh, my marketing directors thought it would be good for me so they were they were up for up for <laughs> me going on it and I heard absolutely nothing and a week before we were due to go I got an email telling us the instructions for joining and um, it was pack a very small bag take one change of underwear and leave your phone at home <laughs> that was it <laughs> so I thought, one what? pair of underwear what the yeah. <laughs> so the, the condition I remember a line from the email it was a very short email but it said the conditions are designed to be deliberately very austere 
I thought, oh my goodness, what have I signed myself up for here? <laughs> no luxury spa massages for you. <laughs> well, no, I, I wasn't expecting that. But um, no, it, it was a massively formative time for me. We slept on temple floors. It was, I slept closer to people on the floor than I sleep to my, my wife in bed here actually but um, it was all about breaking down stuff and to do with purpose and it was massively helpful for me and a lot of what I've written in the in the new book comes out of out of that time and what I've learned since as well actually but um, you know how much have they got to teach us about interconnectedness and reflection and silence and all that stuff it's We've got so much to learn. You know, we we have this colonial mentality in the, in the West of, you know, I've been involved a lot in Africa and helping out in a situation there. And, and we go there, yes, we're coming to help you out of our Western benevolence, but they have more to teach us. And that's always been the case, taking teams to Africa. These are people who, yeah, they want to go and help with the farm, help in the school. And they come back having changed more than the people they've went gone to help. So I think if only more people in the West had that attitude of, of learning from other cultures, I think it would we'd all be in a better place, wouldn't we? That's lovely. So you, you went on this grand adventure, which you didn't know what you were getting into, and ended up, you know, this austere walk and temple floor sleeping situation. Arriving back in the UK, did you come back with... A laundry list of things that you wanted to change or was there a, a new sense of beingness that you could pinpoint at that at that stage i came back with some laundry because i didn't actually follow those <laughs> rules on um <laughs> on the underwear i did take a pair for each day just for the record there i think it was more to do with purpose and and why am i here on this earth i think our business purpose that we were probably happy with where that was at that point but for me personally what is my reason for being what am I meant to be doing for these next few years of my life that was probably the main thing so I I actually saying no to a lot more things when I came back and a lot more focus in terms of what am I here to do was probably the main thing I brought back and I I, I wrote on the I'm not sure if I finished it what on the walk but I wrote a personal purpose statement, which has been very helpful in terms of, right, is is what I'm doing today fitting in with this? Yes, great, get on. Actually, no, this isn't something I should be doing now. So that that was the main thing I brought back from, from that time. What is your personal purpose statement? I don't know if I can read it word for word here, but it's, it's about bringing justice to both the business and political arenas and inspiring change amongst leaders. Wow. Now, I haven't done the political thing yet, but... Uh, yeah, that's that. a whole new ball game there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that when you got involved with B Corp or were you involved with B Corp before that? No, we were involved in B Corp in, well, 2014 is when I found out about B Corp, which was absolutely fantastic because we, I'd, I'd had this notion probably in my mind that business was the main reason that could change the, the world. I thought I was unusual, and suddenly in 2014, oh, there's other people that believe this as well. Fantastic. Let's find out more about this. So that was, we became a B Corp in 2015, which was the first cohort in, in the UK. I think there was about 42 companies that, that certified. So no, we've been a B Corp for a while. That's what I'm saying. That really helped us form our company purpose, but I think I hadn't kind of got my personal purpose alongside that enough until this is walk in India, which was in 2018. So what's your vision of the world that you are hoping to contribute to? Well, I believe that business, well, <laughs> a lot of what business has done over since the Industrial Revolution has, has not helped the world be a better place. It's made it more unequal and, and we can we all know the, the mess the world is in in terms of climate change. So I believe that business is the main driver for change. Politics generally tends to, uh, policy and politics tends to follow what businesses are doing generally in most countries. Charities mop up 
the mess that was created by governments and by businesses. So business is, for those listening, you have a responsibility to be the change makers here because a lot of what you do influences people's lives in, in far greater way than any government policy or, or anything else. So, yeah, I'm mean, a great believer that business is the main driver for change in the world, positive change, and businesses that aren't doing that, to be honest with you, the times we're in now, I don't think we'll be here in 10 years' time, and the businesses that are contributing to positive change will be the ones that people want to buy from and trade with, and they will be the success stories over the next 10 years. So, from a pragmatic and practical example point of view. So businesses that are contributing to positive change are what? Are they, you know, being carbon neutral? Are they supporting charities? Are they being social enterprises? Can you give some? All of the above. Okay. Yeah, all of the above. I mean, the B Corp, cert- I don't know how much you know about B Corp certification, but it's it's basically broken into five categories, and they're really the five areas that can cause influence. So the first is governance. That's about the company culture, really, not a huge section. The three big sections are workers. How do you treat your workers? You know, what is the pay differential between the, the directors and the the lowest paid worker? You know, most companies have got that all wrong, in my opinion. Having a a CEO being paid 300 times what these average workers are paid in the company, how can anyone possibly justify that? Loads of stuff to do with workers and hourly paid workers and being fair, basically, and treating people properly, giving them proper holidays. Um, that's the workers section. There's a community section which would fit in the, the charitable giving, the community stuff in the community doing stuff with local schools all that area diversity inclusions in that section and then a big one is the is the environment you know how what are you doing yes to end up with a lot of b corps in the uk have signed up to be net zero by 2030 we're amongst them we're currently carbon neutral we offset the carbon we do generate but the plan long-term plan with that is to to get to absolute zero by 2030 and then there's a small section on customers at the end, which doesn't really score anyone any points, unless your whole business model is is to help with an underserved people group or something like that. So, But yes, everything. I mean, just from that, you can see how widely businesses can affect the places they are, can't you? Absolutely. I'm curious about this ratio of CEO to worker salary. So, you know, 300 to 1 is not a great ratio. Do you have a specific ratio in mind uh, that you think is better? Well, I think if you if you survey people, and there's lots of work being done on this, most people think the directs of the company should be paid more than they are. You know, they appreciate they they're carrying more responsibility, have more pressure, <laughs> or, or not some of that's um, their own fault. But maybe come to that. The highest point score within the B Corp assessment is if you, if the ratio is less than five to one. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you what ours is. Ours is 3.4. Yeah, okay. Uh, and that's the highest to the, the lowest, including the, the cleaner, actually. Yeah, okay. So, in other words, the CEO shouldn't be paid more than three times any worker's salary in essence. Well, you, yeah. I mean, you can on the B Corp assessment, you can be five to one and, and still get the max score for that section of the, the assessment. But... Mm. Yeah. I just think, how demotivating is it if, I mean, the back of your minds, if you're a worker in a company where that they have ridiculous ratios and coming to work, you know you're coming to work to make someone else very rich indeed. It's not exactly the greatest motivation for, for coming to work, is it? If by January the 5th at 4 p.m. you know the leaders of your company have earned what you're going to earn in that whole year, it's a bit of a demotivation in my in my book. It does make you ponder the purpose, especially if the business doesn't have a clearly articulated purpose in terms of service to the environment, service to humanity, or anything like that. If it's just about purely profit, then that's got problems. Yes, and, and it is, I do believe, those kind of businesses, particularly since post-pandemic, there is a lot more talk around this area about in the UK levelling up is the phrase that's used but unfortunately the government's using that so we can't use it anymore <laughs> but this um, inequality and it's got worse it's got worse during the, the pandemic the the higher uh, end of wealth in, in society have got 
richer uh, and the lower end have got poorer. Mm-hmm. So companies need to do something to redress that balance, I believe. Now, you've got your second book out and it's called The Fourth Bottom Line. So what is the fourth? What are the bottom lines? And which is the number four? <laughs> Okay, so this came out really of of the first book, which is called Forces for Good, which is looking at the triple bottom line, which I think most people know now. uh, So people, planet, profit. If you look after people, look after the planet, the profits follow. And that was created, I think, 28 years ago by a guy called John Elkington in, in the UK. However, as I, that was that first book was the intention was to just write three sections and on, on those three areas. But as I was writing it, I realised, really for myself, that we can't do this world-changing thing in business unless we're changing as people ourselves. Some people may call it spirituality. It's along the lines we've just talked about earlier in the in the chat. You know, it, it's about more compassion. It's about more love, if if we can use that word in in business sense. I think we can these days. I've used it without people thinking I'm a hippie. They they used to think that, if you use words like that. But, um, yeah, it's it's about personal development. It's about humility. It's about the kind of leadership that creates world changes. I mean, in the book, I draw examples from people like Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa. I mean all amazing people who have created phenomenal change and yet how many of our leaders today like that not too many you know it's about self-sacrifice it's about putting ourselves last it's about servant leadership we have this totally wrong idea in our heads of what leadership looks like and it's a very masculine stereotype in our heads this strong leader protecting people lording it over people and actually that's part of leadership, the protections part anyway. But we've lost a lot of the feminine in our leadership because we've been dominated by egotistical males generally throughout the West anyway. Um, so empathy, compassion, humility. You see those as feminine attributes of leadership? Well, I think empathy for sure, intuition for sure, yeah. You know, compassion, humility, I mean, that's they're just good qualities to have. But uh We've lost um, a lot of what leadership is about, I believe, and, and the fourth bottom line is aiming to redress the balance. Okay. Now, you say that compassion should be the number one attribute that you bring to business leadership. Why do you say compassion? Out of all the other attributes, you've got a book that lists 52 of them. Why compassion is the leading one? Well, I'm not sure it's the leading one. It's, it's a kind of summation of a lot of the others. But, I mean, just going through the... The B Corp stuff I mentioned earlier is about having compassion for community. You would behave differently as a business. If you have compassion for your workers, you're going to treat them fairly. The big one for me, and the, the kind of revelation of part of this for me, was I was actually doing a talk on the first book. I hadn't even finished writing it, so I was doing a talk to a chamber of commerce on the three Ps, people, planet, profit. Got to the planet section in the middle and put a slide up on the screen of some Bangladeshi people photo of them wading through water, being driven out of their homes by rising rising water levels. I started weeping on the stage, which was really embarrassing at the time. It hadn't happened to me too much by that point. Since has quite a lot, actually. But I was talking about climate change and actually at that point realized that we have this theoretical thing about climate change in certain countries where i live and where you live and other places that it's this oh yes it's this we must we must do better we must reduce co2 what we don't see actually the damage we've done is killing people which is a harsh way of putting it but it's definitely true 200,000 people lose their homes every single year in bangladesh due to climate change 200,000 in Bangladesh? Yes. 200,000? Every year. Yeah, there's a lot of people there, obviously. But, uh, yeah, yeah. This, it's such a low-lying country. Every year, listen to this, this is even more astonishing. Every year, six times as many people die from air pollution as died for COVID in the last year. Across the planet? Yes, every year. Across the planet, both in both cases. From pollution? Yes, from burning fossil fuels. How much have we done about that? 
compared to how much we've done about COVID, which is, a, I know it's a huge problem, COVID, obviously, I'm not lowering that, but air pollution is killing six times as many people every single year. Mm. Is it more significant in some countries than others? Yes, it will be, yeah. But, uh, I mean, there, there is actually, it, interestingly, I mean, it's been the it's cities generally and, and, you know, cities where there's poor air quality and it, it unfortunately is a lot of developing countries including that but interestingly in london two weeks ago even though many people have died of air pollution here it was for the first time put on someone's a little child's death certificate that that was the cause of death in the uk but, air pollution yeah, yeah now it's not the first death from air pollution but it was the first time that a doctor's written that on the death certificate Wow, did they? How how do you die from air pollution? Is like an asthma. Yeah, yes, it's breathing difficulties, and and yeah, it's obviously linked with other other secondary things. But um, yeah, yeah, it's very sobering. So the point is, when you realise the damage we're doing, and have compassion for the people that we are damaging, you know that is going to change the way you behave as a business. Since that moment on the stage, I mentioned, we've been a lot. I've been a lot more passionate and a lot more emotional about climate change and it's not this theoretical thing for me anymore i'm more driven to change what we do as a company and you know we're a very small player obviously but if every small company and every medium-sized company every large company does what they can do we will make a difference but there just aren't enough people who are passionate about it to do that right now it's it's happening it's definitely happening but so you put up that slide of the Bangladeshi people wading through water, evacuating their homes because they no longer have a home. Yeah. And that linked up with your brain, with the facts that you already had about so many people dying, 200,000 a year in Bangladesh from climate change. And it struck you that the personal stories, the human stories. Yes. Was, yeah, was I, didn't the, know that, I didn't know that stat at the time, actually. But yes, I, I, it was the connection between climate change and people because you can't have compassion for a, a tree. It's, well, you can, but maybe can. You, you the, totally the, can. The, the Hindus probably <laughs> say, yeah, of course you can. But um, it brings it home when it's it's people dying, it's children dying, and, you know, those of us who've got kids, it always it always comes home, doesn't it, when it's, when it's children impacted. Well, whichever size human, an aged human, uh, that can often touch uh, some really important heartstrings. One of the things you say is that Growing in empathy will boost your business. So I love this paradox. You know, it's not, you know, because you don't, you don't have empathy just so that you can make a profit. You know, empathy will cause an upturn in business. How do you, how do you link those two? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I, I think it's, it's a lot of it's to do with, with trust. And, and people, if people are human, their leaders are human, then... The people who who work for them, I think, on a simple level, have a lot more respect. But the whole thing works a lot better than these, you know, the hierarchical situation that we've we've had in the past. Of leaders are up there and all the little people working down here. Humanity is about hum. A lot of that book is about humanity. I talk about vulnerability as well, but it's it's about being human. I mean, these are human qualities, and I'm from a very un. Well, actually, an emotionally dysfunctional family. I'm still really learning on 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 this side, but um, you know, I didn't cry for twenty years. To give you an example, for twenty years, yeah, at least probably, yeah, yeah. No crying. No, because my 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 dad told me that that wasn't the kind of thing that boys did. Did you ever feel like you wanted to cry, but you just refused to? Um, I think I'd lost the ability to. I mean, it's uh, I've certainly made up for it in the last ten years. Don't worry about that. But um, <laughs> all the time now. But yeah, I, again, that's another th- way. How many times have you seen leaders of company cry at team meetings? Probably not very often. Now, I don't think it's good to do it every day. It wouldn't be great. But I am more than comfortable <laughs> with showing my emotion in those situations because. We are human beings if we're leaders, just as everyone else. But too often we've we've got this divine. That what div- yeah, actually they behave like they are divine sometimes. But um, got this divide between 
leaders and and the people we're, we're all human beings showing empathy to the people that work for you and to your customers even and suppliers that's what humans are meant to do you know we are community mammals aren't we and yet we've we've taken out a lot of our the way we live our lives in the west the, the idea of success here is to get a big house with gates that you can lock and shut yourself off from the community that isn't what being a human being is about you know we need that human interaction with people and the same is true for leaders that is for any other human beings how has your business changed since uh, well I'm not sure if the trip to India was a watershed moment or whether it was happening before that. How is your leadership in the business and how is the leadership and how has the business changed over time? We're much more, I mean, the, the, well, this all mixed together really, but the B Court thing has, has helped us understand what we're doing. Definitely as a business, people love coming to work to do something that, yes, we're doing what we do, selling specialty food, but we're also making a, a difference in the world. People don't often leave. People are happy. The lowest ever score we've had, do you enjoy coming to work, is the question in the annual survey. 94% yes is, is the lowest score we've had. We have had 100%. So people enjoy being there. So the B Corps thing was the catalyst for that? Was it different before the B Corps certification? Yeah, yeah, no, we've not always been in, in that place. <laughs> it, it, it's a mixture of things, isn't it? It's probably, you know, my leadership, the leadership team, B Corp, it's all all melded together. But knowing why we're coming to work, having an atmosphere of fun, one of our values is have fun, get it done. In fact, someone who joined this last year, he's a sales director. I've known, he was a supplier, came in, known him for years. But he said, I'm, I'm, Paul... I haven't been to a Cotswold Fair meeting where there hasn't been laughter yet. He was amazed. He'd come from a place where that wasn't wasn't the case. But yeah, so when you've got people not seeing work as this thing that they have to get out of the way in order to pay the mortgage or, the, uh, yeah, let's get work out of the way, then we can really enjoy life at the weekends or we can really enjoy life when we go on holiday. That's not how it should be. We've got this separation between work and the rest of our lives. It shouldn't be like that. So if you create an atmosphere where it's, yeah, people are happy to come to it. I know they're also happy to be at home with their families and also happy to go on holiday. But it's not this getting work out of the way mentality. Then you're going to have a much better pace, happy people are productive people and you make more profits and that's been the case for us over the last the last few years we've had the best year by far we've ever had in the in the last 12 months what's your vision for your company well we are massively growing at the moment um obviously our whole business model of consolidation delivering loads of brands to retailers in in one drop is a carbon reducing business model so the more that comes through us I don't always necessarily think growth is a good thing, but in our case, it is because less deliveries going into shops is massively reducing carbon impact. We're just about in a month's time, a month yesterday actually, going to open our first retail and restaurant business. So we're supplying shops, about 1,800 shops all over the country, and we're going to become one of our own customers in effect. So, What prompted that? Well, I guess I've I've been doing this for a long time, so I've seen lots of good examples of good retail and lots of examples of bad retail, and I've probably always thought, actually, we can do this better (laughs) by taking a lot of the good and getting rid of the bad. And there was an opportunity came up through a friend of a friend. It's on a really busy road in the Bristol Bath area of the UK. Um, It's too good an opportunity to miss, actually, and I didn't because we never had a lot of debt in the company. I didn't particularly want to put a load of debt in, but even we were going to put that in and take the risk on it. As it happens, we had such a good year during the pandemic, we're hardly having to borrow any money to do this now. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really exciting. And and for me, especially exciting to, to start something new and with all the lessons learnt, all the people lessons learnt, the planet lessons learnt over the last few years, with a brand new team, 
starting again is really really exciting and I, I was with them last night actually we're just recruiting a load of people to work there I mean they're all under 35 they absolutely get what we're doing it's remarkable what's taken us kind of years to become at, at the main wholesale business they have got overnights so they've totally tapped into what we're trying to do and it's really nice to see actually so I'm yes there will be challenges but we've got a great team there and this this will go some if it works well we'll we'll do more of them that's really cool it, it sounds like that you've accelerated human development by 20 years in some ways you know so the modeling that you're doing in your business practices and the whole b core thing is showing a model that wasn't there previously um for us you know i think we're of the similar age i think <laughs> so 20 years ago when i was 30 ish you know, th <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> How do you say 50 without saying 50? <laughs> so 20 years ago, we didn't have these business models, you know, it's something that's been an iteration as our, as our society has shifted. And there's been this huge demand and calling forward of people to, to think and lead differently to solve these issues, as you say, the industrial revolution created. And if we can short circuit that or advance that quickly now so the 20 year olds get it because there's a model there and it's been proven and there's a clear vision of what we need to do to clean up and to progress humanity, then they could get onto that now in their 20s. Yay. Then we can accelerate human development across the planet. And, and the best thing for us with, with that, we've recruited a lot of people and not just for that but the main business as well over the last year and we are getting much much better people now because we're it's very clear what we stand for our values and really really good people obviously have a choice of where they work because they're quite sought after and we are getting those people we didn't used to that's fantastic so yeah so paul what's a big recommendation you have for listeners or readers of your book in terms of what do you do with this stuff what's a good stepping stone for them <laughs> number one stop which a lot of people have done to be fair during the pandemic haven't they this certainly here people have a lot of people have assessed what they're doing with their lives and gone for walks and maybe done a bit of meditation and stuff like that but if you are still in a running around like a headless chicken mode then please stop i've done it i've got that t-shirt I wasn't particularly happy when I was doing that. It's, you know, it's no good for you. It's no good for your family. And actually, it's no good for your business. So you will be a better leader if you take time out, reflect, reassess what you're doing, and uh, be more purposeful in, in what you do moving forward. I think that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful recommendation. And certainly... I agree with you. There's plenty of people who have who have stopped through the pandemic and went, what am I doing? And how am I living my life? And I don't want to go back to what it was before we had this enforced pause. And we can choose to have more regular pauses and to think about those higher purpose things about what am I really doing here? And to choose to have a wider circle of influence like you, Paul, that's been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've really enjoyed your perspective, your stories, and really... I am heartened, heartened, I think that's the right word. I am heartened by the work that you're doing and the impact that you're having and the people that you work with specifically in your business and also the ripple effect around the world. So thank you so much for everything that you do. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I think the word heartened is right, isn't it? Business with heart, I think probably sums up a lot of what we've talked about. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> thanks again. I love it when I'm interviewing someone and they just tell a story which exemplifies completely the principle that I'm teaching in Amplifiers, which is around vertical leadership development. Meaning, and it's something that I speak to in the interview, that we can continue to shift and evolve our worldview, how we see ourselves and how we see others and how we operate in the world to respond to greater and greater levels of complexity for greater and greater positive influence. And Paul did that beautifully as we talked about the move from expert to achiever to what I call amplifier and has been known by other names. But the ability to be purposeful and contributing in the work that we do as leaders in complex situations to deal with difficult challenges like climate change, like inequality, that's what Paul embodies. So I really enjoyed this conversation with him to talk through 
those moments when you have an awakening to something beyond what you're doing day to day and you invest your purpose in the work that you do and see the ripple effects out into the world. It was, it was just such a joy to see a leader like him doing that. And, um, you know, I was having a conversation this morning with a different leader over coffee and she was asking me, why do you do it? Why do you run programs like Amplifiers? And for me, it comes down to this, better leaders, better world. And it gives me extreme joy to support the leaders who do the hard work of leadership, who reinvent their businesses and themselves in service to humanity and the planet and to all of us who are living this great, wonderful, joyous life on this beautiful blue dot in the midst of a huge universe that is just, just delicious to be part of. Okay, so anyway, I got heaps out of this. I hope you did too. If you're interested in expanding your sense of purpose and your ability to influence, then do consider joining us in Amplifiers. You can find all the information about it at zoeralph.com. Click on programs and click on Amplifiers and the information's there. If you want to speak to me about it, just email me, zoe at zoeralph.com. I would love to be in conversation with you about your purpose and what you can bring to light life and the difference that you can make in the world. In the meantime, live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast with leadership expert Zoe Routh. For more about people stuff and to contact Zoe, go to zoeralph.com.